Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 478. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because here's the thing. Many times we go out there to build our business. We want to make an impact. We want to be someone that can make a difference, if you will. And at the end of the day, we, we feel like sometimes that the, there's a competing objective. I can either do well or I can do good. I believe, however, that you can do good and do well simultaneously. And I think today's guest has that same thought process. In fact, what's really cool is that many of you might also feel like you are the underdog, like all the cards, quote unquote, are stacked against you. Well, that's exactly how today's guest has felt too. But more importantly, He's not only been the underdog, he's a proponent of the underdog, and his business totally is formulated to help all of us become something bigger, better, and better. I have with me today none other than Eddie Lauren. Over the past 30 years, he has successfully purchased and transformed $3 billion, that's a B, $3 billion worth of multifamily real estate acting as either principal or advisor which really amounts to more than 180 thriving communities covering approximately 40,000 apartment units throughout the United States. That's called a lot of impact. In fact, his company name is Impact Housing. But what's exciting about this is that they really consider themselves to be the perfect marriage of impact investing and multifamily real estate investing, providing that triple bottom line. So that's the financial, environmental, and social returns to their investors. Now, you and I today, we're going to learn a lot. And a lot that we are going to learn, other than just how to overcome being the underdog, we're going to also figure out how to build a great business. At the end of the day, let's make sure that we are ready to listen and take some notes from Eddie Lauren. Eddie, how you doing? Great. What an intro. That's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you were quite welcome. Uh, I thank you for for the good work that you guys are doing out there. So that, that I mean, you're making a difference and uh, an impact. I have a feeling I'm going to keep saying impact a lot today. Yeah. Well, let's make sure everybody knows what impact really means. You know, the original impact investors started hundreds of years ago, but seems like it's fallen, you know, it's coming into favor more in the last 10 years. For example, a, you know, an insurance company like Prudential came up with an impact investment to protect in life insurance a couple hundred years ago, wives for their ability to be able to pay if they lost their, their husbands. And so that's just the beginning of the impact story. Today, we have been doing um, impact investing for many years by taking, we say, blight and making light. You know, there's a lot of neglected, there's a lot of slumlords out there, there's a lot of people who really don't care for the resident. And so what we do is we go in and we renovate and we give people a clean, safe, affordable place to live. We treat them with respect and dignity. They stay, they pay, they refer their friends. It's a very simple, unglamorous business, but it's really rewarding. And we've been able to change people's lives where they live over and over again. And that's the exciting part. Indeed, it sounds like that 100%. Now, this being the first time that you are here, I got to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody else. You ready? Sure. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. 
because I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Chief among them, uh, as an entrepreneur, I can occasionally envision myself flying around town using our products and services and saving our customers and, and maybe even wearing a cape or tights from time to time. Also, like a superhero, though, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you think about Spider-Man, for example, there was a time where he was just a kid going to school, trying to get some good grades, taking some photos, doing his own thing. And then one day this event happens to him and suddenly he's bit by a spider, realizes that he's got superhuman abilities and he gets to choose to use them for good or evil. So my question to you is as follows. (laughs) Before all of the apartment units, before impact housing, before everything that we know you for today, what we want to know is who is Eddie Lauren? I'm just a little guy trying to make a difference in the world. I grew up of modest means. I was always the underdog. I always felt like the underdog. And sometimes we even feel like the underdog and we're not. But, uh, you know, I lost my father when I was 10 months and my mother when I was 17. And we really scraped by, but had a lot of love and respect. And it was always the adage, you can be poor, but you got to be clean. And so as I've progressed in my life, I've always said, you know what, I had incredible mentors, incredible opportunities in this world. Not everybody has had that luck. So at least my share of contribution is to be able to provide lower income, hardworking class people, the clean, safe, affordable place to live they deserve. And that's really my my objective. But I came from a very, very tough background. It was a big struggle. I emotionally and psychologically, and we just, I struggled many years to try to put myself on top and do the best I could, but I always wanted to treat people like I wanted to be treated. And so far, so good. Totally understood. Now you said something in that, that I think was interesting that I think a number of listeners would want to understand some more. You you said, you mentioned that you were the little guy, et cetera, the underdog. But you also said that there were times where I felt like I was the underdog when you're not. Explain what you mean a little bit more by that. Well, we're all our own worst enemy, aren't we? And the problem is that oftentimes we're so self-absorbed, focused on what we think other people are looking at us like or what other people are doing and really being competitive in nature. And it really works against us. And you see it in your children sometimes, too. It's like a magnification of your own stuff. And you're just like, oh, my God, I wish I wouldn't have given him that gene. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, we really, we really try to, um, to be a, our own best proponent, but oftentimes it backfires. So if we focus more on the other instead of ourselves, I think we'll all be better off. Got it. Now, you, you also mentioned that you, you're, you lost your dad at 10 months, your, your mom, we'll call it too soon as well. And with that, sometimes those, those things that are, that are missing help us develop a, into a different person. Would you say that those have been formative either in your business or the person that we know today? Absolutely. You know, I just went to, uh, on a trip to Auschwitz in Poland and it sounds like a non sequitur, but I'll mm. tell you how it <laughs> relates. Yes. You know, this woman, I, who we, who is on a survivor and she walked through these hallowed, disgusting grounds. And as she described her experience, she just crawled through the muck and said, just one more day, just one more day. And, you know, you have to say that it, as bad as things are for us, it could always be worse. And so the meaning comes from looking forward to tomorrow, having hope, having dreams, having visions, and hopefully they're not delusional visions, <laughs> but good ones. <laughs> and and focusing on just surviving one more day. And oftentimes, like I said, I, I felt like I was cursed. I felt like all the cards are stacked against me. But, you know, the old saying you can't control the wind. You can only adjust your sails, right? So right. you got to persevere and be positive and do the best you can every day. But, you know, as, as whatever level you're on, whatever success you've achieved, 
you're always looking behind you because that's sometimes, unfortunately, that's your nature and your your it's innate, and that's that's what we're trying to you know battle our demons, right? Indeed. So how how do we go from the the seventeen year old version of yourself to well today where <laughs> impact investing exists and you and you've had this amazing effect on the real estate industry and in all of the lives what what was that journey like well it was one of um real discovery and and i guess a lot of some despair some concern and you know some hope and you know i made the joke about de- being delusional we, you know we all have these dreams we think we're going to do all these things and you never know where you're going to end up but you just got to keep going and uh you know i grew tremendously from all the the angst and the turmoil and you know it's just a matter of we all have our own way of meditating or calming ourselves or doing whatever it takes but i grew you know i grew from every experience and you know i've it's not been that easiest road even through my career i've had some really surly characters i've run into and they've wanted to uh really take advantage and I tend to be more nice than not. So, you know, you learn your lessons that way. You can't always be the nice guy, but you also have to be fair and reasonable and and respectable. And so, you know, it's a constant struggle, honestly. I mean, it doesn't end. That's why everybody has to realize, you know, you're never there. You are never there. (laughs) And, you know, if you really listen to a lot of songs on the radio, they're all about the same subject because we're all trying to tell ourselves the same thing. You know, we think we're supposed to be there and you never get there. So just enjoy the ride. Indeed. Now, with all of that that, that you guys are doing today, what, were you always in the, the the real estate? Was that from beginnings? Like, you know what? Real estate's where it at. I, you, were you literally gifted with the clarity that this is where you needed to be from the beginning? Of course not. <laughs> you know, I, I always thought about what am I going to do to make a living? Food, clothing, shelter, right? I tried food. That didn't work really. Clothing, I was a good salesman, but not that great, right? And then I got into the real estate business because I did have an uncle who owned one building and retired on it. So I said, hmm, that's pretty good. Uh, So then I moved through the food groups of real estate. I started in office leasing because I had my stars align on big high rises. Mm. So I would go and try to lease office buildings. I did pretty well. And then moved on to someone took me to do industrial and then I did shopping centers. And then, you know, I ended up in the multifamily business, which is the apartment business. And I said, this seems a little easier and more nimble because the leases are more like one year rather than five and 10 years with huge capex, huge uh, tenant improvements and, and leasing commissions that you need to have a big fat war chest for. And you can make a lot of money, but it's way more volatile than the apartment business because everyone needs a clean home. So I gravitated toward that. I found that, you know, through travel and through experience of taste, I was able to come up with a really good formula to look at a property and have the vision. And that's really important vision to see what it will end up looking like after we finish our renovation. And you know, many people don't have that gift. So I would say that's probably one of my gifts. I've honed it, but it took a long time to develop it. And so we, what do I mean? We go up and we look at an older property and I want, first of all, someone to look at my sign and say, I only wish I could afford to live there. And lo and behold, they get inside and they can. Beautiful paint job, really nice clubhouse, state-of-the-art fitness center, resort-style pool, everything. I don't know how old your audience is, but some people will relate to this. Suave does what theirs does for less than half the price. You can't build B and C product and those rents. So oftentimes the properties we buy, the rents are half the price of new stuff, but we give them everything that they get in an A property, as we call them, uh, you know, brand new stuff, but for B and C residents. So everybody deserves that dignity and that respect. And, you know, oftentimes they don't use the fitness center, the gym uh, or the, you know, the pool, but it's there and it's part of marketing as well. So look, there's a business side of it too, but there's also the human side and we have health and wellness programming where we bring people together and try to teach them about eating well and living 
uh, and building community through health. And that's a pretty passionate thing for us because we, we really think that a lot of people have live in food deserts and they don't even have experience to have good, healthy food to eat. And there's no whole foods within miles. So that's pretty cool to be able to do. And, you know, people can go to a YMCA or a synagogue or a church or you know, when they're hardworking all day, they're tired. Or you can have after school programs in the clubhouse where you live with a community garden and the kids can grow their own vegetables and really experience it. So that's that's kind of the fun part. And uh, that's our impact. We really are trying to change people's lives by giving them exposure to really healthy eating and healthy living. Indeed, indeed. Now, uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a moment because there's a number of people who would say to you, well, why not just stick with the the A class, the higher class stuff, the the new, the shinier? Um, and why 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 do this work? You you've done office, you've done industrial, you know that stuff. Why why not stick there? What's so attractive? Not just about multifamily, but you're choosing multifamily to serve in in an area that a lot of people don't necessarily look up for. You know, they kind of look. Let's say they look down. What what's the name of your show? Cash Flow Diary. Okay. A-class properties are trophies. They don't t- tend to generate a lot of cash flow. I know. <laughs> generate beautiful, <laughs> brochure quality, shiny, uh, ego investments. I'd rather go where the masses are and invest in good, clean housing that's always going to be safe. And that will be the cash flow opportunity because people – all gravitate toward the nice shiny stuff, but they don't want to do the work that we do to transform these communities into thriving opportunities. So that's the answer, of course. You good, good, good leader of the witness. Thank you. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. But um, there's this concept out there that if I want to do well, I can't do good, but you guys stand straight up in the face of that, where you do well by doing good. What would you say to those who think that way? Hey guys, thanks for listening as always, and I'm glad that you continue to support with each and every download and subscription and share. One of the things that I want to ask you, though, is where are you listening to me from right now? I know some of you, maybe you're on a treadmill, maybe you're washing dishes, maybe you're walking that dog, and some of you are actually in a vehicle driving right now. One of the fun things that you can do, get some of your time back, is begin to living a car-free existence. But even then, it can be a little complicated. So one of the things that I want you to do is I want you to go over to Zipcar. Go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. It's a way that I am able to still go get a car just for a few hours very, very simply so that if I have a lot of errands to run and sheets to drop off and running to the short term rentals or if I just want to go for a long trip up to LA and back, etc. I can rent a car for a very, very short period of time. And the cool part is I don't even have to pay for any gas. Again, go to joinzipcar.com forward slash cash flow diary. Well, I mean, it's a matter of your priorities. And it's a matter of your risk tolerance. By going into affordable and workforce housing, by the way, in 08, when the world should hit the fan, French, these properties were full. Why? Because people went down on, on, on the scale. So they couldn't afford those A rents anymore, and they had to double and triple up and move into B and C rent properties. And uh, so that's an incredible opportunity to be what I call defensive in your investing and be safe. Indeed. Now, when it comes down to, to actual execution of this, is there a particular type of property because I, I know if I don't ask this question, someone's going to send us an email saying, okay, so Jay, what type of property am I, if I want to do what Eddie's doing, how do I find those, those magical properties? I'm like, okay, let's just ask Eddie. That way I don't have to answer that email. Well, you got to start small depending on where you're at and you got to find 
properties and opportunities in the brokerage community or there's LoopNet or there's all these places. It's really about networking and relationships. I've done a lot of deals so people know I'll close and they come to me, but you know, you got to start somewhere. Um, but you have to be able to see and have a vision of that property looks like crap. <laughs> if I if I bought that property, I could do this. I could make beautiful. Let's take a 10 unit building. I could I could paint it with two tone paint. I could put a kind of a, a foam molding around that will be an accent to the paint I'm going to do. And I can add a fitness center in this little area. At least someone will have it if they ever use it. Maybe they won't, but at least they think they'll use it. And you're giving an amenity and you're giving value. It's all about giving value. Hmm. You can't raise anybody's rents until you earn the right to raise their rent. And when I'm saying raise their rents, look, I'm not in business for pure philanthropy. We do have opportunities for cash flow. And so, but we just keep it affordable. We like to target the 80% of what's called area median income level. So if we don't, we rent to people, let's say their area median income is 50 grand. We rent to people that make 40 grand, you know, that that's the kind of thing um, or less, but it's a matter of giving these people a little different twist a little more creativity in the property so they can feel proud of where they live and that's what value is about and so we're going in and we're raising rents maybe 100 bucks 50 bucks but still affordable you know absolutely now many would say that we are facing lots of challenges chief among them obviously you know inflation being something where rents are on the rise uh the the cost of living obviously on the rise and how can someone even achieve a, a business model to where they can keep housing affordable? Hmm. Well, you got to go where they ain't. <laughs> you know, I mean, you got to buy product that's older and value. That's what the true value add is. But I, I, I that's there's no simple answer other than that. Well, what I, and, and here's where I'm coming from with this is that even though rents are on the rise, more and more of these affordable or workforce housing communities, they're, they're getting harder to find. I mean, even if, if I, especially if I'm a tenant, I'm like, where am I going to stay? You know, it just seems like it, it, it keeps sliding backwards. Uh, I get where you guys are coming from, but at the same time, uh, you have to pay, you've got to pay something for the building. You've got to pay something for the labor. And it seems like it would be this constant tug and, and battle uh, for you guys to, to actually keep them affordable. Well, if uh, it's all about when you buy, you got to buy right and transform and keep them affordable. But, you know, like, for instance, we're buying a high rise in, in Maryland. Um, and these rents are really, really low. And we're going to keep them and put on an affordability covenant with the county working together to make sure that everybody makes a certain amount of money or they can't rent there. And we're going to keep the rents at a moderate level. But that is going to require a little bit of help from the from the government. And that's how we do this. You know, you either it's Section 8 vouchers that come in or it's some kind of low interest housing, lowest low interest loans. But this is the way it's got to be. You're going to have to be a public-private partnership. And unfortunately, this current administration is not so keen on the working poor. And that is a challenge that we can nothing we can do about. Incomes are stagnating. Rents are rising. It's a problem. I can't st tell you it's not a problem. It's a big one. And until a paradigm shift happens in this administration, it's going to be even more challenging. But at least from my standpoint, I can do what I can to find these diamonds in the rough, shine them up, and keep them affordable. So, uh, and, and, th and that's the type of work that I, I want people to know about. But additionally, I believe that you guys keep even the opportunity to participate with you guys open to a wider audience than most. Is that true? Well, I just started uh, this. Um, I just started this impact housing REIT, which is a crowdfunded REIT. It used to be that only the wealthy could invest in opportunities like ours. But now, due to the JOBS Act, 
right. last administration, um, <laughs> we, it democratized the opportunity for anyone and everyone, regardless of income level or wealth, to invest in these kind of opportunities. So our minimum investment's $1,000. We're cut out the middleman. There's no Wall Street middleman. There's no huge load. There's no fees. It's direct to me. And that's what's awesome about it. It's really great. So, you know, it, we it, we get a better deal. The investor gets a better deal and everybody wins. And that's also what I wanted people to hear, because there's a number of people who are listening who are like, man, you know what? I, I like what you guys are doing, but I don't have enough money to participate. Uh, I have some, but I don't have enough. And I wanted them to hear that, that, that there was an avenue and that you guys are actually helping on both sides of the fence it's where those have been excluded before can now be included and those who might feel neglected in terms of their their housing needs you guys are out there to to help make that happen so what would you say then when you look to the future given the current state of the union or maybe state of disunion uh, what would you say then therefore is the the future either uh, of impact housing or just the the concept of being able uh, to keep real estate uh, affordable? What's it going to take to make that happen? It's going to take so many different and combined efforts, government, private sector, local city and county governments, new uh, philanthropy investment foundations, endowments have to be able to provide where the government can't. So if let's say someone can afford to pay $900 in rent and the rent's $1,500, someone besides the government, because there's only so much left, has to step in for that extra $600 to keep people affordable at affordable rents. And so, you know, that's what I'm working on, but I'll probably, you know, leave this earth hopefully a long time from now and and maybe it'll be accomplished but the 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 pi- private sector must step in and help and i've been writing a lot of articles about that i'm very involved in i'm jewish i'm in the jewish funders network trying the crusade the fact that foundations need to not only invest in these properties but they need to invest in vouchers to help people stay in their homes be in their homes you know there's plenty of churches across the way that sometimes step in and they pay the rent for their parishioners because they may have one foot on a banana peel or they may have slipped on that banana peel. And you know everybody's human and one paycheck away and you could be evicted. So we try our best, but we also run a business. And so we try to work with a lot of outreach organizations besides the government. I'm not trying to say the government's the only way, but the government has to really make it a priority to organize and uh, help and contribute as much as they po- possibly can. And we need to incentivize these foundations and wealthy, wealthy people and the 1% to also, s- instead of building solar in Botswana, to <laughs> put homes above our own people, our own kind. The more you talk, the more I like you. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I know. That's all I know. So l- l- talk to me a little bit uh, about... Uh, you, you had mentioned that you were doing things on on your properties for health and wellness. Talk to me a little bit more about that. Well, to us, it starts with a community garden. Really important that um, that sense, because it's always right in the middle and by the clubhouse, and people walk by and say, oh, my God, people are actually growing their own vegetables. Yeah, why don't you come out Saturday and join us? And we'll we'll teach you how. And and it's usually, unfortunately, or fortunately, the kids, not the adults. So after school programs are really the way we get to the parents. But otherwise, the parents are busy. They're tired. We get it. You know, you can't you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. All you can do is the best you can to give people the opportunity to get involved, learn. And again, oftentimes it's really about getting their kids in. And we have after school programs with 20, 30 kids. And then the parents come around and they start to talk. And then they met other parents that are like minded. And that's how you change the world. One one person at a time. Right. Indeed. I, I like that. Now, is this a, a program that you guys are you have at all of your properties when they're conducive? Like, you know, we're buying uh, 50 units here in, in Los Angeles and we're deeming them all affordable for homeless and 
uh, supportive housing. So there's no room for that. You know, we do the best we can on an old building, but whatever. We always try to give value however we can. And every prop, every child's different. Every property's different, right? So that that's the that's the short answer. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. Now let's pretend for a second that there's a an entrepreneur who's listening who 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 thinks, yeah, that's the type of real estate. Uh, you know, investing that I want to do, and maybe they want to to start in their own neck of the woods. What have been some of the things that you have learned going down this route that you did not know at the beginning, but wish you had known? <laughs> Look for what I call appreciative capital. I did a lot of business with a lot of geniuses who knew more than me, and they'd never turned a unit. They've never collected rent, they never leased a unit. And that's a real tragedy because I got squeezed and I was naive. You need to go after people who appreciate you and appreciate what you do and they're passive because you can't have two cooks in the kitchen. So to me, the most important thing is know who your investors are, be very clear about what it is that you're going to provide. And if everybody's on the same page, it will be fine. But if people are looking to ride you like a horse, which I've been ridden many times, that's not a win-win. And so it's really important before you jump in, because I jumped in out of angst. We talked about some of my uh, desire earlier in the in the show about how I was so anxious to get in. I had to do a deal. And it's mm -hmm. like, you know, you get in bed with some surly characters and because you panic and you got to not panic. It's easier said than done. That's why, you know, I'm old now. <laughs> <laughs> totally understood. Totally understood. So for, for those that have listened this far and are like, wow, I am, I'm I'm like they maybe they're having the same experience I'm having going you know what the more he talks the more I like him and, and they want to find out more about what you guys have going on what's going to be the best way to to follow up with you everything's at impacthousing.com so www.impacthousing.com all the information's there our track record our story what we do it's all there excellent so uh, as we wind down here let's I have one more question for you because I'm curious to hear your answer. Uh, let, let's pretend that someone listening is, you know, they're standing at what I like to call the precipice of a decision. They, they've listened this far and they're like, man, I can do this. Man, I can make a difference. Oh, and, and they get more and more excited because I can do well and do good. And they're, they're like, you know what? That's it. I'm doing it. But you know, like I know, Eddie, that when we reach those moments of decision, we're often accompanied by a companion and that companion comes in the form of a voice and that voice often says things like really you no there's no way you are you, do you remember what happened last time you tried something great or for some people they're even related to that voice so my question to you is as follows let's pretend they're actually going to follow through and now they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours what would you suggest that they do well, let go. <laughs> That's the most important thing because hmm. the fear is what is not rational. And if you have a sound, whatever, I don't know what they're going to do in the next 48 hours, but whatever you're compelled to do, if it's sound and you've done your homework, and if you haven't, you should take more than 48 hours. But if you have done your homework and you're ready to pounce and everything's teed up, just close your eyes and go and let go because if you don't let go. The past will eat away at you and keep you from ever being who you're meant to be. Wow. I like it. Well said. Um, I definitely appreciate all the things that you guys are doing, uh, the people that you're serving, the change that you're making, being that change agent and enabling others to participate in that change, in that process of change uh, as they can as well, even for as little as a thousand dollars that that's that's an amazing thing that you guys are out there making happen uh, i also want to thank you for taking the time to share your knowledge your wisdom as well as your insights here with us today at the cashflow diary pleasure 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means get over to impacthousing.com. Why? Because you know you liked what he had to say. Now do something about it. That means get over to impacthousing.com. That means make a plan to execute your plan. And then, well, you heard him say it. Let go and get it done. That's very sound advice. And I know you have the ability to follow it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.